because I had done this a little bit different way. My tank is a little thicker, so it didn't fit through that hole, and I didn't want to make that hole any bigger. But, but John had already realized and had figured it out in the supplemental instructions that you needed to remove some of the nose ring if you're going to take the tank out after you put it in. Well, we already did that, and because our tank is bigger, this way was not appropriate. So I just didn't want to leave that as a confusing issue. That is also in the supplemental instructions, a thing about putting sleeves into the motor mounts. And I didn't want to do this because I wanted to redrill this for other motors in the future, especially for the 90. So this is something you could always uh, just keep in mind. If you're, gonna, if you're basically going to put a motor in and never take it out, you might want to do this. If you want to, in the future, make it that you can change motors and maybe drill different holes in there. Uh, maybe or maybe not. But... This, this is something you need to think about in, on an individual basis. Also, another way to deal with this would be, in the, with, of course, that little hatch comes off the top. If you were having trouble with the motor mounts sinking it, the blind nuts sinking in, because don't forget, this is just like clamp mounts. You could always put a set of aluminum pads on top and thread them or make steel pads. That would be another way to do this. See, what has to happen is... When you choose the motor, because this this ship is designed for a wide variety of motors, width-wise and where the holes are. If we were only going to use one motor, well, this would all be very cut and dry. But the the little pads, the little tubes that would normally go in there, if you were making a permanent motor installation, well, if you do it the way I'm doing it, it gives you the option of putting more holes in there in the future and then just put the other another pad on the other side in essence you're making clamp mounts or the last choice would be you could buy a set of clamp mounts from Brodak or from me and just use the clamp mounting system a lot of choices and these are all good choices none of these are bad now see for me the issue was the reason I couldn't use those tubes and it's well it's difficult it's difficult to to look at this without drilling those quarter inch holes some of that would have come right out the side of the mounts because on a road jet they go really close to the edges of the mounts so again this is this is a thing for uh it like buying a pair of shoes individual taste but i think all of those methods would work fine you just have to figure out which one is going to work best for you Now, in the course of working on this, and in the course of getting the flaps and elevators and all put together, by the way, that went together just exactly the same as the elevators. But I, I thought maybe I should do a storyboard because there's a couple of other issues in here. Number one, this push rod that comes out, that comes off the bell crank, it's soldered on top, but it's got threads on the bottom, and it's got a nut, but it's not a locking nut. It's just a nut. So here's what I'm suggesting to do, and let me... I think it's easier to do it with a storyboard. Here's the wing top, here's the wing bottom. That is, and there's a spar here and a spar here. There's also a piece of plywood here. This is the wing center. And I think this is one of the things that, that is critical. Now, the way this bell crank mounts in, They've got a piece of threaded rod, and it goes up over here, through the plywood. The bell crank rides in here, and, and this is a threaded rod. Now, here's what they did that, that I think we can upgrade ourselves. We don't, have, we don't even, even have to wait for them. The standard way is they have a nut here. Now, I don't know if there's a bushing in there or not. But this is a standard nut on each side, and that's perfectly okay. The bell crank does need just a tiny bit of slop there. They've got a nut up here. Now, the problem is on mine, one of these is a lock nut, one isn't. One is a lock nut, one isn't. Castellated lock nut. So here's what I'm suggesting. I built this whole area up with thick CA, so there's no way this can move up or down. And it actually should have a nut on both sides if this were going to be engineered from the get-go. But we just want to make this as easy to do an upgrade as possible. What I did here is I built this up, this whole area up. This is thick CA. The red is thick CA on both sides. 
So now I've pretty well got this confined, whoops. I've got this confined in both, both dimensions. But the problem is if one of these nuts from vibration or from time, and remember, we're looking to keep this for a long time, starts walking down, this is gonna have a lot of play. So what I'm gonna do, and I, I've already done it, is I put thick CA on the whole threaded part. I just painted it on with a Q-tip. So in essence, now that bell crank really can't go anywhere. Now, the other problem is the push rod end, now let me do another storyboard. Now on this particular one, here's our push rod. Now, what happens is it's got a washer soldered over here, and that's the right way to do it, and then it's got threads down here. Well, what happened is it's got just an ordinary nut, not a lock nut. Now, there are ways when you put that nut on, if, you would, if you're doing it from scratch, because I can't get in there and take that nut out right now, you could put that on with, with Loctite. That's one way of doing it. The other way is I'm going to mix up some JB Weld and just JB Weld a big blob right on the end of that. Now, and of course the bell the, the bell crank is in here. But but these are just little things. Now I looked at another issue that this this push rod and again I looked at the upgrades and the directions and, and some of it it just maybe it just escaped me. But there's gonna be other ways to do this and the way I looked at doing it, well I'm gonna show. But but I looked at a lot of different ways of doing this. And here's, what, here's the problem, is if I put JB Weld on that now, I, I'm pretty much done for the day. And I want to finish this. I want to be flying this tomorrow. So what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to look at another way of doing this. And, and it's not a real big a, a deal to improve this. And by the way, make sure you cut notches, rough this up, do something to that rod if you're just going to JB Weld it in on both ends, of course. In other words, that rod, when it comes out to the end... If it's smooth and the tube it's in is smooth, that, that has a tendency to pull out. Well, a better thing would be if it looked like this and the tube itself was rough. Get in there and scratch it any way you can. Roll up some sandpaper or whatever. Rough is always better. This And these are engineering upgrades that, that aren't going to be a real difficult thing to do. But, but in my case, what I want to do, and it's different, because I want to hook this up, and I want to move right along. And the only way I know to do that real quickly is I'm just going to solder it. I'm going to put a piece of wire across and solder it. If I can't figure out a way of doing that, and what that does, it saves me the time of waiting for the JB Well to dry. Now these are little brass eyelets that I get from Brodex. And I'm going to put little bushings in these controls. What I did, I bent a little bit longer piece of wire, soldered a washer on it. This is not anything high tech. I just want to make sure I've got a bushing. And then I'm going to solder a piece of wire on the outside. I'll wrap this with copper wire for sure. these bushings. You can get these right from Brodag if you don't have them. It'll be a nice tight fit on the wire. Even though I'd like to have a little bit of slop in the elevators, this is going to at least give me a bushing surface so as years go by this, these controls should last a really long time. I always use Stay Bright Silver Solder. No other solder besides Stay Bright. Deflux it with baking soda and water. This will be one of the upgrades that, again, a longevity upgrade. And I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure that the controls wouldn't last two or three years the other way, but I know this way they'll last ten.
And not many of us, uh, well, I like to have everything last forever, but this is, this is a cheap insurance thing that it will. Now, whenever they're done with a the solder, this is sulfuric acid. So what you want to do is baking soda and water, deflux all the joints when you're done, and we'll grease them. Now the trick is, with this splice, get the bell crank in neutral, get the flaps in neutral. We have a couple wraps of copper wire just holding it in position. I'm just going to tack it on both ends. And then I'm going to wrap some of this with copper wire and then solder the copper wire. What happens if you try to wrap this all at once, You just it's hard to get the adjustment. Now what that does, that slop adjustment, that slider, lets me infinitely get the flaps neutral and the bell crank neutral. I want the bell crank and flaps neutral at exactly the same time. Now you can see where I've got little notches in the end of the wire. I'm going to wrap copper wire in there. And when I solder this, the copper wire acts as a redundancy. I've also got this just tacked in. All I need is one tack just to hold it in place. While I have it in place, before I do the final solder, I'm going to work the controls, make sure I've got neutral. Same amount up, same amount down. And when I solder that washer, I'll take that clearance out of there. But that safety wire it just acts as a safety part. And now with that soldered and that tacked, I need to make sure everything is in neutral now and that I have equal up and equal down. Now with all that soldered in, the next, the last thing is to make sure we don't have so much bell crank travel that this locks in one position. And that's a critical, critical thing, because if that bell crank goes more than 90 degrees, it's, it'll snap all the way over. So we don't have any more. That looks pretty good. But if that was to go all the way over, in other words, a bell crank should have some way of stopping. It shouldn't be able to go completely around. And if we did have that, we'd have to put some kind of block of wood in here or some kind of dead stop. But just check that Pull full down, full up, and make sure it isn't locking one way or the other. That's an important thing. Now we're almost ready to get the wing installed here, and I need to pull all of the covering back because we need to get a wood-to-wood -wood joint. Now, the way the, the directions say to do this, pretty simple, and actually it's a pretty effective way to do it. And I have my own little technique for lining up the tail, so I'll show that. But the way on the way on the directions works fine. This way works fine. But you've got to get the joints. The thing to keep in mind here is these joints have to be wood to wood. They cannot be covering to covering. And one of the the joints that needs to be really accurate here, this joint as it goes up on the wing, we need to take the monocoat, or I should say covering, I shouldn't say monocoat, and we need to carefully peel this back. This might be, or probably is, one of the critical joints of the plane, because this is going to hold a wing to the fuselage. And we got a plywood doubler here, so we'd like to try to get this really accurate if I can. Actually, even to the point of building up a little fillet here. Now when you sand this, here's, here's a little trick. Leave the dust there. Don't blow the dust away. The dust is going to help make what amounts to be a little fillet when we actually do go to glue this in place. Now the next thing is I have to get the covering removed pretty much the same as, as what I did here from the middle of the stab 
Shows how to do that on the directions. It's just a question of removing that covering. Get the covering removed so when this goes down onto the onto the wing. Now let's see how how much we've got to get. Here's the wing. This is pretty much of a kind of a snap fit, but it's got to go over that wood. You know, as I go to fit this, here's what happens, is one side, that side is nice and tight. This side needs to have just a little bit of material taken away. Oh, I'm going to guess not much either. Just the slightest amount. Just take a tiny amount of material off of this edge so that that fit is like a, like a notch fit. What I did, I laid a piece of tape out to show about how much of that material has to come off. It's about a sixteenth of an inch. I used the Dremel tool and I'm using a sanding block to get the last little bit so that this is a tight fit. And once I get that snapping on there, can do a test fit. If I if I have to, I just move the tape over just a little bit until that that part is just going to snap right on. Here's an ear, an area up here. See, we have a little bit of an extra clearance in the back, and it's tight up here. So I want to just take a Dremel tool and just just take ever so little amount of material off of there, so that that fits a little bit tighter. Okay, now that fit is just about how I like it. Now, next step is to attach the push rod and then this will be ready to glue the wing in. Pretty much from this point we can just pick up from the directions. What I want to do is tack glue this first as per the directions. Just hold it in place. I got a little pad because I'm working alone underneath there. I want to get that joint as tight as possible. Then I'm going to turn it up on its edge and redo the whole joint so it's going to tend to wick under and then back. And the only thing to be careful of is if you're doing the top, don't let it wick down out the other wing and glue it to your knee or something. See, once that's tacked, and just hold it for a few seconds as that goes off. Once we have this tacked in place, we'll be ready to make a permanent joint. It feels good. Now once I have this and I know it's it's tacked in place and I've got a whole joint of thin CA, now I can kind of just let the thick CA work its way down and make a fillet. The trick is don't let it go out the other end. I've done this and it all of a sudden looked it was leaking down the whole side. Rub it with a few Q-tips and just hold it. That'll take a minute or so to kick off. Now we'll do the other side. Now it's amazing. It's really amazing when you get that joint done how solid that is. That's, that's one of the impressive parts of this whole thing. That really is pretty solid. Now the next thing is I just have the, ta the, the tail taped in place. I have to remove the monocoat, do the same thing, remove the wood, and then get into the tail alignment. The tail alignment is a critical thing. So the first part of alignment is to make sure as we drop down that the, the tail is disappearing equally on both sides of the wing. In other words, I want the stab and elevator parallel to the wing. Then the next thing I need to do is check that I have the two hinge line dimensions exactly the same because I'm just pinned here I'm not glued in yet now the thing that's important we know to stab and the wing are aligned that way this is tacked in place we know when this is neutral this is neutral and to get 
you can do the ball link adjustment or you can just slide this back and forth very slightly to get the two neutrals the same. Just confirm that we have it. And I don't want to have the tail out this way. Very important that the hinge line, the hinge line at the tip is exactly the same. Now we're ready to put a permanent glue join. Pull out the pins and do a permanent glue join on that. And all that's left is some little uh, odds and ends pieces. Now the next thing we have to do the same, pull a covering off and then lay out where this covering would go. So, we go, so what we're doing in, a set, in essence is joining wood to wood. I can just use thick CA to fill this in. Now one thing I'm going to do as a little modification to the way this normally would be built, because I'd like to have an adjustable rudder, semi-adjustable. So I'm taking some little pieces of tin can, ordinary tin can, and making three little what would be hinges, except they're made out of a piece of tin can, and I'll be able to bend the rudder and give me kind of an adjustable, a, uh, a, a basic, easy, adjustable rudder without a big problem. So obviously I'll put some slits in here, put these in place, put the rudder in, and we're, we're closing in on having this done. This app definitely is going to be done in one day. Now you slit this with a little knife that gets pushed in. And I can use that. It'll, it'll really be a nice little way to do it. And what this allows me to do is just put a little bend in there. And if I find a spot that I'm real happy with, I don't want to adjust it anymore, I could put a little piece of tape on that. But having it flexible like that, that'll be fine. I can just bend it. Next step is just pressing in and installing the tailwheel wire and there's a little cover that goes over this. Again, removing all the plastic so that we get a wood to wood joint. And as we're closing in on this, it's, uh, it's been a lot of fun putting this together. I'm, I think you really could do this in five hours. They claim five hours. I'd be thinking you could do five if you didn't change anything and if you didn't have any interruptions. Now in our case, we have interruptions, phones ringing and things going on here. Santa's out front. As I say that, my wife yells down, Santa's out front. I'm building arfs. We can't fool with Santa Claus. Look at this action. I'm trying to build my arf and Santa comes by. What the hell's going on here? Holy mackerel. So maybe Santa Claus will bring you an arf too. Unbelievable. I knew we'd get it done today. It's dark, but we're closing in on having it done. And we're gonna fly this tomorrow, Santa or no Santa. Santa Schmanna. Okay, that's dry. By the time we get back from checking out Santa Claus, that's solid. Let's get him out the wheel. I'm gonna get all the bottom. Two little strips cut so we can glue that bottom piece in. Grease up the controls for the final time. Next thing is the landing gear. We're working our way forward and hopefully we're less than an hour away from having the uh, well, <laughs> having Santa Claus come over and give me another wharf to build. Now they say a 16th hole for the landing gear. The screws. <laughs> this is <laughs> I have to tell you, this is some of the heaviest landing gear wire I've ever seen. It's probably, it's bigger than an eighth, I think. Heavy duty wire. Now, I had thought of an idea and, you know, having done, having gotten this far, I can see there's a possibility here that one of the things we could come up with is like a super arf where you would, you could hollow some of these parts out a lot more than they've been hollowed out and in this case, we could we could mount a carbon fiber landing gear on here real easy. Probably save a couple ounces, among other things. But for right now, this has really this has really been an eye opener. 
There's some things about the way this goes together that are just really, really nice. Some of them I think detail improvements will come on future models. But we basically, we, you'll, you're never more than one day away if you lost your good plane or if you only had one plane. Thing is, you're never more than one day away from having another plane at the field. Your landing gear mounted right up. Wheel collars holding the wheels on in case we need bigger wheels for more prop clearance. I don't know, I'm not sure what that's going to be. We need to put on these little tail fillet pieces. Again, stripping away some of the covering. These just become the fillets in the back. Now before installing this little top cowl cover, I hollowed some of this out just in case we want to fit bigger motors in there in the future and, and again possibly that 90 as one of the choices. We need to lay out tank venting. As just looking around there's, there's a lot of little details left but all of them are five ten minute things. Tank venting, I'd like to have one overflow vent and I need to lay out where I'm going to put a uniflow vent need to think about that for a minute relative to where the motor is and where the tank is going to be. Each installation will be just a little bit different. And the uniflow should always be on the inside of the circle facing forward so we need to bend up a piece of copper tubing. We just need to put in an overflow vent. Now we can install, install the engine and tank and tubing. Uniflow vents in there, overflow vent, overflow, uniflow, nice and solid. Now the next thing is going to be to drop in the aluminum pads. The motor bolted back in position. We need to, at this point, look at all the things that are unique to this motor. We need to make sure we have needle valve clearance. That we have clearance for all the tank vents and I need to hook the tank vents up. And then cut the cowl openings. I'm looking around, the decal on the wing. Try and make a little list. I don't want to forget any little detail. Then what I'll do is I'll go back to the book and make sure I haven't skipped any steps, any pages. You need to put some tip weight in. But as you get to the end of a project, it really starts to get to be a lot of fun. Now in our case, it'll be easier to set up some of these, these tank vent things, get the tubing on. And of course, make sure none of the tubings are pinched or kinked or in some way going to restrict us. Just a close-up of how I wound up using the venting for a, this is for a road jet, but of course it'll, and this, this tank has a little detent for some of the headers and tuned pipes that I've used that tank on already. Now after the motor is installed, I want to get the tubing going to the engine. Make sure all the bolts are tight. Now, I always like to bench run an engine a few times, or minimum once, on the ground, and then retighten all the bolts. That's a good safety tip, no matter what, what size motor or what brand you use. Needle valve fits right in. Don't have to cut a hole for the cowl for this. Row jets usually start roughly uh, back out three turns from when they're in all the way, and we'll tighten the cinch nut. But of course, that's going to depend on which brand and which size of engine you're using. Now every, every one of these, depending on which engine you're going to use, is going to be totally different. 
but I wanted to start with and you can the way the directions show is fine I wanted to do this and I can kind of free him.